Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. The title of the day's message is Perfectionism, a Stronghold to be Demolished. Hey, I am looking forward to this. I believe this is going to be a powerful message for you, for everybody who will listen to this or was watching on the simulcast on our YouTube channel. And before I get into it, hey, we're in Igniting Hope. We are at the end of the first week of Limitless Kids, a two-week online uh, event using my books. Let's just laugh at that for kids, part one and two. And that is happening right now. And also next Monday, August 1st, 2022, when we're recording this, we're starting our course, Fully Convinced, The Art of Decision-Making, Attaching Great Faith to Who We Are and What We Do. By the way, that course that book, I believe, uh, is so timely right now with so much anxiety, so much doubt and double-mindedness. I believe it's going to be a real, real blessing. And you can find out about both of those on IgnitingHopeAcademy.com, The Limitless Living and Fully Convinced. Hey, let's talk about perfectionism, a stronghold to be demolished and uh, this podcast better be perfect or I'll be unhappy. <laughs> you know, it's, I just remember just as a young preacher, just so much and how I struggled with uh, just after a message, I, I would just withdraw my faith and, and rehearse what I did wrong and, and just had such a perfectionistic spirit. And I've come a long way uh, in demolishing the stronghold of perfectionism. And by the way, the greatest strongholds to be demolished and pulled down are not regional demonic principalities. They're belief systems in the minds of believers. In the Old Testament, there were literal giants that they had to defeat. God says, I've given you the land, now go fight for it. You know, I bet they thought, hey, if, if God's given us the land, why do we need to fight for it? We need to fight for it. But we have the confidence that we are going to win. And that just causes us to persevere because it's already been given to us. In the New Covenant, we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises, but we need to fight for them. It says in Ephesians 6, 17, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's called a, a sword because we're supposed to kill something with it. And what we get to defeat are these mindsets, these strongholds, pessimism, victim mindset, unworthiness, shame, unforgiveness, <laughs> discouragement. And perfectionism, it's one of them. It's, it's an opponent. And so I am looking forward to giving you some strategies today to talk about it and give you five ways to overcome it, to overcome it. Now, let me give you a, a definition of perfectionism. Psychology today, here's what they say about perfectionism. It describes it as a trait that makes life an endless report card on accomplishments or looks. It's a fast, enduring track to unhappiness. It is often accompanied by depression and eating disorders. What makes perfectionism so toxic is that while those in its grips desire success, they are most focused on avoiding failure. So theirs is a negative orientation, a negative orientation. They want success, but they are most focused on avoiding failure or looking like a failure. Now, I've experienced four kinds of perfectionism I want to talk about today. One is perfectionism towards me. Secondly is perfectionism towards others in my life, societal expectation perfectionism, and Christian commitment perfectionism. And when we first talk about perfectionism towards ourselves and 
towards myself. And, uh, and it's really uh, the, the religious spirit and perfectionism are, are married. And basically, those under a religious perfectionistic mindset cannot be joyful until everything is seemingly perfect around them or, or in their lives. And I know as far as my, my own life and that this personal perfectionism, it, it wants to create a deeply rooted fear of looking like a failure, of looking like a failure. And by the way, even right now, something's happening to those who are listening to this or watching our YouTube simulcast of this podcast. There's breakthrough to break off the fear of man, to break off being a people pleaser. And, and I want to just say this. The people that God wants, that God needs to like you, will like you. The people that you need to have like you will like you. Those who don't, you don't need to have like you, they won't like you. I'm not saying this doesn't mean we don't pursue excellence in areas and just become careless, but I want to break off the spirit of feeling like uh, we can't look like a failure. I believe that there's just so many areas. I talk about this in a podcast and blog I did recently called Unsuspecting Sources of Shame. And these unsuspecting sources of shame are appearance shame, possession shame, family situation shame, education shame, vocation shame, where these are areas that we feel embarrassed about, feel less than about. And that when we have a perfectionistic attitude, it leads to shame and it leads to embarrassment. And then there's perfectionism towards others. This really hinders relationships. This hinders relationships where we have a perfectionistic attitude and we know what it's like, whether it's a parent who only points out the faults, a coach that we had who only points out our faults, friends, who have that tendency, who aren't happy with us. And, and it's, I remember, you know, just as I've come out of this and it still creeps up every once in a while, but I've had great breakthrough in this. Jesus in Hebrews 1.9, he created a culture of gladness. He created a culture of gladness around him. It says in Hebrews 1, 9 that Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness above all his companions. Great leaders, great parents create a culture of gladness because to create a culture of gladness, you have to let go of a lot of stuff in your relationship. I used to not want to be glad around people because I thought if I was glad around them, they might think they're okay. <laughs> they might stop working on their stuff. Now, uh, gladness is a powerful trait of leaders who create a healthy environment around. It doesn't mean we're not talking to people about things that need to change or upgrades, but it, it's, it's a different spirit. Hey, Jen, thanks so much for being on our YouTube Live. By the way, if you're listening to the podcast and you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, that might be a good idea, and you could watch me do these podcasts live. And so perfectionism towards others creates hurt in relationships. Uh, societal expectation, perfectionism, it results from the media, advertisements, social media, and other forms of peer pressure where we feel like we have to do every aspect of our lives perfect. I remember when we had our first child and we have three children, my wife, Wendy, and I, and just the, the pressure to be the perfect parent, to have the perfect child. 
And by the time we got to number three, we had let go uh, of a, a lot of that. And then the last uh, type of perfectionism I want to mention is Christian commitment perfectionism. Uh, it results from legalism, a taskmaster God concept. Uh, it results from an inability to understand Christian growth as a process and a lack of understanding of what we are called to do and what we're not called to do. We're not, we're not called to do everything that everybody else is called to do. And so when we hear great sermons and, or people who are going after a cause, sometimes our perfectionistic spirit that we want to, we feel we got to do everything. And that just wears us out. That creates a lack of ability to attach faith to who we are and what we're doing. And that's just a bummer. So four types of perfectionism, perfectionism towards ourselves, perfectionism towards others, societal expectation perfectionism, and Christian commitment perfectionism. And so let me, um, we all battle this. Let me give you five keys to demolish the stronghold of perfectionism. Number one is focus on improvement not what people think of you. Focus on improvement. Perfectionists tend to overemphasize people's perceptions of their looks, possessions, intelligence, etc. Now, when we focus on improving ourselves, and that's what we want to do, I mean, it's, it's whether it's how our yard looks, how we appear, our skill sets. And when we make that our goal, that's going to be a key to continuing to break off the spirit of perfectionism. Number two is do something and celebrate progress. Do something and celebrate progress. Those with a religious mindset of performing for the approval of God and others can only be joyful and celebrate when they achieve perfection. This hinders them from trying new things. The Apostle Paul had a different attitude about this. He said in Philippians 3.12, he said, Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of, of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. He pressed on. Do something and celebrate your progress. You know, we, we celebrate toddlers learning how to walk. We celebrate. They don't do it perfectly, but woohoo, you're doing it. Every area of our lives, almost every area where we're going to grow in, it's going to be like a toddler learning to walk, and we have to celebrate ourselves. Number three, and this fits in with that as well, is recognize that those who succeed most also seem to fail most. Those who succeed most also seem to fail most. I used to think I had a good year because I didn't fail at anything. And the Lord said, but Steve, you didn't do anything. You didn't do anything. I, I spoke... I, emailed a friend of mine who just finished a book and and it's his first book and I just quoted some things at him I just encouraged him I said thank you thank you for increasing your talents thank you for stirring up the gifts that are in you thank you for breaking off false humility thank you for not hiding your light under a bushel thank you for giving God something to work with and it's vulnerable. You start doing things. Those who succeed most also seem to fail most. I'll tell you this. I probably fail, if we want to use that word. I don't really use it. But if we want to use that word, I probably fail more than anybody who's listening, or at least most. Because I'm trying things. I'm trying to walk in higher levels of joy, higher levels of doing relationships. Uh, of, I'm trying to walk as an author. I'm trying to walk as a communicator. I'm trying to increase our reach with, with YouTubes and things like that. And, and 
I'm growing in it. Is it perfect? No. But I realize that it's a process. We, we develop skills by focusing on our identity and by practice and practice and practice and getting good feedback. So how to overcome perfectionism, how to demolish this stronghold. Number one is focus on improvement, not what people think of you. Number two, do something and celebrate progress. Number three, recognize those who succeed most also seem to fail most. And then number four is redefine success. Redefine success. Now, success is not a goal to be attained, but it's a state of being. Success is not a goal to be obtained. It's a state of being. If I need something outward to validate me as a success, whether it's education, whether it's how many followers I have, how much money I have, then I'm not a success. Those things are going to be ultimately the fruit of what's happening on the inside of me. God's method of making great leaders and great influencers is to make us successful on the inside when we don't look successful on the outside. This is what, this is what happens in the wilderness. This is what happens in wilderness experiences that we go through is that we become successful on the inside when we don't look successful on the outside. 3 John verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So we focus on soul prosperity, which is getting successful on the inside. And then number five, how to demolish the stronghold of perfectionism is that we embrace authenticity. We embrace authenticity. When we open up to others about our struggles, we open up the door for grace in us and around us. James 4, 6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. This is especially important for leaders, parents, and teachers. If we are not authentic and demonstrate an unwaverly success, and we, we're just focusing on giving a persona that we never struggle, we withhold the whole story of our process and potentially uh, enable crippling perfectionism to get on other people, to get on other people. And so our authenticity, and I love to share my own struggles. My whole message is talking about how I struggle to have hope, how I struggle to have joy, and I still share that. It, it's the process. So wow, wow, wow talking today about demolishing the stronghold of perfectionism uh, in, in our lives. And, and again, we do that by embracing authenticity, redefining success, by recognizing those who succeed most also seem to fail most, by doing something and then celebrating progress. And by the way, we celebrate progress in, in other people, and then we focus on improvement, not what people think of us. Let me just ask you some questions. Do you withhold a celebration of yourself because of a perfectionistic attitude? Do you withhold celebration of people, of your family members, your co-workers, others, because of a perfectionistic attitude? Do you feel like you're a failure because you do not meet all of societal's expectations of you, whether it's your looks, education, whether you've achieved what 
you think you should have achieved by right now. And I just say, thank you, Lord, for freedom. Thank you, Lord, for freedom from perfectionism. And there's people on here who have a great gifting to break off perfectionism off of others. Some of you are already doing that right now. But I just, I'm hearing, just even as I'm praying over you while I'm doing this podcast, somebody within the sound of my voice is going to free people, especially from eating disorders, especially from depression that's caused by perfectionism. You're going to go to the root of it, both scripturally and in medically and psychology, and bring freedom. And bring freedom. Wow, wow, wow. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast from Igniting Hope Ministries. We are here at Igniting Hope to ignite your hope because there's no hopeless circumstances. There's just people who do not have hope. And once people get true hope, circumstances cannot stay the same. Hope is the belief that the future will be better than the present. And we have the power to help make it so. If something's going to change, somebody believes they can make a difference. They can make things better, and it will get better. That, that, that's the key. And I want to just say this, that if we try to walk in faith without hope, it's unhealthy. Faith people without hope have a very difficult time of overcoming disappointment because faith people without hope tend to put all their eggs in one basket. And if, some, if a certain outcome doesn't happen, then there's a, there's a subconscious belief that we can't live because that's not happening. And one of my other favorite definitions of hope is this, that hope is an overall optimistic attitude about the future based on the goodness and promises of God. So hope, people... They thrive in the Lord. They, they thrive because they believe they can thrive no matter what happens. If an outcome that they're believing for doesn't happen, then something better is coming. They're adaptable. Hope people are radically adaptable. And by the way, remember, too, that the joy of the Lord is your strength, is my strength. We don't need strength at the end of the battle. We need strength in the middle of the battle. I've got a lot of things going on right now, uncertainties, relationships that I wish were stronger, uh, things in my own life that I wish I would do better, just negative news in the media, concerns. And I, but I need strength right now because of all those things. And, you know, really for everybody listening today is probably not a good day to walk in radical joy. Well, I've never really found a, a ideal day to walk in radical joy. <laughs> and how do we stir up joy? Well, we stir it up through thanksgiving. We enter as gates with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a gate to many things, including joy. And as we become thankful and we focus on what we have rather than what we don't have, we focus on what God's doing rather than focusing on what we think is not happening. It's a gateway in the joy. And then we also walk in joy by magnifying the Lord and not the problem. We magnify the Lord and not the problem. We can't make God bigger, but we can see him bigger. And then we... Stir up our joy by Psalm 37, verse 4, delighting in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And the delighter is delighting with unfulfilled desires. And it's a key to see them fulfilled. Do you have unfulfilled desires? Do you have things that you're believing for that haven't happened yet? Do you have outcomes you want to see that haven't happened yet? Do you have prayers that you've prayed that haven't manifested yet? Do you have prophecies over your life that haven't met? Well, then you delight yourself with unfulfilled desires. Delight yourself, <laughs> delight yourself in the Lord. Not in yourself, not in the outcome happening, but in the Lord. Woohoo! 
God, I can't wait to see what you're going to do in that situation. I can't wait. You know, we're to live above, not beneath. And what I'm talking about today causes us to stay above and, and keep from getting under it. We have people say, under the circumstances, this helps us get above. Delight yourself in the Lord. It's a key to see release. Wow, wow, wow. Hey, if you like our podcast, if you just tell somebody else about them. If you like, um, you just want to connect with us, go to ignitinghope.com and you can sign up for our newsletter. You'll receive the blog podcast every Monday. And then we also, you're going to find out where we're traveling to, what we're doing, courses that we do, et cetera. We'll promise not to overwhelm you with emails. We send very few out, but we try to do them strategically. <clears throat> and what I like to do also as we close, I love for you to take five seconds and pray for Igniting Hope Ministries. Five seconds. In modeling, I'd rather attach faith to five seconds of prayer than 30 minutes of prayer where I don't attach faith. Little things that make a big difference. And we feel your prayers, our staff, Wendy and me, our team. We have a mandate. We've got a big vision that belief training, that belief workouts will become more popular than physical fitness workouts. So, yes, please just take five seconds right now. In faith, pray for us at Igniting Hope. Amen, amen. Hey, just want to let you know, we also have certified Igniting Hope Belief Trainers. If you want to do online belief training sessions, you can find out about that at ignitinghope.com as well. All right, God bless you. I look forward to being with you again on another podcast from Igniting Hope Ministries.